Well, good morning, everyone. Let's all stand and let's start off our service today with a prayer and then we'll get to worshiping the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you for how you have brought us all here together to worship you, to read the word and to learn about you. And Lord, let us follow you with all of our heart. Help us to live lives worthy of the calling we have received. And help us as we go from here to share the gospel and spread the good news. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the people said, Amen. amen. Well, some of you said amen. <laughs> some of the people said amen. That's the title of this song. No, no, this song is called All the People Said Amen. Let's sing and worship the Lord together. This morning. It is good to see uh, lots of familiar faces, and as I warned you last week, we might have some guests today, and indeed we do have some guests with us today, so that's kind of fun too. Um, the reason for that, as I've been announcing routinely, um, is just a reminder, um, camp meeting that we participate in starts this evening. Um, so if you haven't already, go ahead and pick one of these up out at the information table. Uh, it gives you all the information that you need except one little note that I will make for you. 
Um, and I don't know if this will be a positive or a negative for you. I'll let you decide and just don't tell me. Um, I do want to, in fair disclosure, let you know that our evangelist will be coming tomorrow morning. He also serves as a full-time pastor of a church and did not feel that it was in the best interest to be gone for two different uh, Sundays from his own congregation. So he's going to be coming in tomorrow morning. Well, what are we doing this evening then? Well, we're going to have a wonderful worship service and then you're stuck with me for tonight. So I'll let you decide whether that's a positive or a negative for you and whether you choose to come. But I sure hope that you will come and join in with the body of believers in real worship and kicking off a week um, of respite for some in a retreat-like atmosphere to be quiet ourselves and listen to what the Lord might be telling us. I know that some of you are still working. You don't have the time off, those kinds of things. We would love to see you come out even in the evenings just to enjoy the evening worship service and, and the evangelist, Dr. Friedman, who's going to be with us um, from, from Mississippi with us. He uh, teaches in Jackson, Mississippi at the, the seminary there. Anyways, so that's what's taking place starting at 7 o'clock this evening. What else? Oh, I was also supposed to announce a reminder, uh, particularly for our youth. We will not be having youth group this Wednesday because of camp meeting. So instead, we will be out there, and there are uh, there is youth class in the morning starting at 11 o'clock leading up till noon, and you are welcome to join us for the evening service. Hey, br drag a parent along with you if you want to. Uh, we love to have you out there, and I know a bunch of you are planning to come out and enjoy that as well. I think that's it as far as announcements. We're trying to keep them low today. So I think that's it for announcements, unless I'm forgetting something. Okay, we're good. Good. Well, then it is our habit to give you a moment of time here at the beginning of the service, and it's become special to us to just breathe a little bit and Seek the Lord in your own heart. Prepare yourself for this time of looking to him, listening to him, maybe just resting and letting go of things for a little while. Um, so I'm going to be quiet and let you pray to the Lord and be with him. And in a moment, I'll close this in prayer altogether. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you and praise you for the beauty of this day, not only in the sunshine and the lovely, comfortable weather, um, but in the beauty of your presence and gathering as a family, as a collective, as a body with you in worship to proclaim we love you, we trust you, we lean upon your sustaining grace we ask for your um, right and righteous meddling work in our lives that you would expose what needs to be exposed and, um, and lead us into cleansing, purify our lives that we might be fully yours, wholly de dedicated to you, that you would have joy upon joy in the fruit being born in our lives, that it would honor you and bless you 
And Lord, that you would use us as your instruments in encouraging others, in, in pointing the way to you, in testifying that you indeed have the power to change lives because you have changed us. Lord, if there's anyone who, who is still either just uh, ignoring you and, and, and got pulled in this morning or is, is struggling with what to believe, how to believe, what direction to aim their lives, God, I pray that this would be the day that they would listen intently to the moving of your spirit, the speaking of your word, that they might um, receive the gift of faith and trust in you with their whole lives, that they too might know freedom from sin and your saving grace and the, uh, the peace that passes understanding. Thank you, Lord, for this day you have given us. We offer you our worship and praise in your name. Amen. Let's continue to worship together. Please stand once again. Let us worship the Lord. Savior, like a shepherd lead us, much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us like we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us like we are. And we are thine who thou be Guardian of our way, keep thy flock from sin, defend us, see us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. You 
have no words of life, no words of life. Come write your holy truth upon our longing hearts and strengthen us to shine against the dark. Us from the lies, the enemy will speak. No guilt remains for those you have redeemed. Where else can we go? Where else can we go? You have no words of life. The Living for 
Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou in Thy atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be Thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live. Hope lies for Thee alone. Living who died in my place Bearing on Calvary My sin and disgrace Such love constrains me To answer His call Follow His leading And give Him my all Oh Jesus, Lord and Savior I give myself to Thee, for Thou and I have sown it, didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be Thy throne, my life I give henceforth to Thee, O Christ for Thee alone, living for Jesus. Wherever I am, doing each duty in His holy name, willing to suffer affliction and loss, deeming each trial a part of my cross. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou in Thy atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be Thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, hope lies for Thee alone. Living for Jesus through earth's little while. Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thy atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be Thy throne, my life I give henceforth to live, O Christ for Thee. may be seated. The uh, preschool children, aka Sprouts, are dismissed for their Sprouts time. Pass Nathan. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. We'll let them head out, and then we'll, we will start with prayer as we head into our time of uh, looking to the scriptures. Very good. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word that you have preserved for us. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for how you taught us challenged us and demonstrated the, the fullness of the Father to us while you were here present on earth and ministering to us. 
Lord, I pray that we would learn from your words today, even in this late hour of this earth, that you would teach us what it means to be a part of your kingdom and that you would give us strength and courage for the day in which we live and that you would um, remind us and comfort us with your blessing, your loving kindness, your favor to us. Lord, if, there is an, if there's anyone who has not made a decision to, to follow after you, to, to purpose their whole life toward you, uh, I th- pray that you would give them a sober understanding of just what it is that you are asking of them. And that when you have moved and directed and prepared their hearts, that they would make a commitment to you with their eyes wide open and their hearts ready to receive. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Well, this morning, if you want to turn... As they say sometimes, you had one job to do. <laughs> Anyways, okay. <laughs> Vic knows better to, than to ask technology-related stuff of me. The one thing he asks is that I would put fresh batteries in at the beginning of each month. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, We are going to be anchored in Matthew chapter 5 this morning, the first, oh, about 13 verses or so, no, 16 verses of Matthew chapter 5. Those of you who are familiar with your Bibles and have studied quite a lot or have been stuck in church many, many, many times, uh, you will be familiar with this section. We have a nickname for it. Um, We often call the broader portion of scripture that it in that it's in the sermon on the mount sound familiar okay and the first little part here of the sermon of the mount on the mount is what we refer to as the beatitudes okay um, it's a mix of uh, this idea of blessing and god proclaiming or describing those who are blessed as well as talking about the the character traits, the attitudes that those people um, exhibit in the world. So we're going to talk a little bit about this, get down through verse 16. For those of you who are new with us or our guests, we are, are walking through a series that systematically walks through Scripture. It is not exhaustive in any way, and we are not going to certainly exhaust all that could be said here this morning, um, partly because some of us want to get to lunch this, mor- this afternoon. Um, but it is systematic, so we've been walking through Um, the New Testament now this year and looking at the life of Jesus, some of the things that he taught, some of the lessons that we learned and his deity and showing the fullness of God on display through his life and time with us. Okay, well, here's going to be, if I can get there, the big idea this morning. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Jesus has called his disciples to live in such a way as to reveal God's glory to the world. 
Now we're going to be reading about Jesus' literal disciples, that group of gentlemen that he collected around himself and poured extra time into, invited to travel with him and be with him and observe all that he did um, so that they could carry on the message and be the beginning of the church. However, with a full understanding and a full study of Scripture, we come to realize that this model of discipleship is God's understanding. It is his desire. It is his purposing for all of us, all of us who would respond to, in faith, the gracious saving work of Jesus Christ. We are called his disciples. And so this very teaching that he gives to the crowd and to his uh, special group of 12 that are close to him on this day is just as applicable today for you and I. In fact, this area of scripture is so challenging to the human spirit that even other religious groups that would have um, would not be in harmony with our assertion that Jesus is God and is the only way to heaven and salvation, are attracted to, are pulled to, are um, like the gravity of the sun drawn to this area of Scripture and say, this is good. This is right. This is, this is um, challenging to the human spirit. Well, we're going to break this into three main parts this morning. We're going to see that Jesus' disciples are blessed, and he's going to use that word a lot, blessed. And then we're going to move into, and if you're familiar with the scripture, you know the outline already. We're going to see that his disciples are the salt of the earth. We'll talk briefly about that. And then finally, we'll finish up with Jesus' disciples are the light of this world. Okay, here we go. Ooh, let me back up. Let me read it. Let's read together. Uh, first 16 verses of Matthew chapter 5. We read this. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be sanctified. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works 
and glorify your Father in heaven. We'll stop our reading there. Here we go. Jesus' disciples are blessed. Over and over again here, Jesus uses this term, blessed, blessed. And so I want to start with a, a little bit of context. I need to be careful here of how much I get into my imagination versus history. We know at the close of the Old Testament, before the scriptures go dark in that gap in between what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament, that the people of Israel, in particular, specifically the southern kingdom of Judah, had been in exile in Babylon and Persia for a long time and had finally been released to slowly move home and to reestablish, to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. And so we celebrate in the close of the Old Testament that, that the opportunity is there, that they're home, that they're coming home. But there's also a certain weight at the end of the Old Testament and a sadness you see, when they dedicated the temple, one of the things that is noticed is that what's referred to in the Old Testament is the Shekinah glory, the obvious, seeable presence of God, that fire and light and smoke that showed up when Solomon's temple was dedicated and filled the Holy of Holies, that didn't happen. The Ark of the Covenant wasn't there representing the presence of God with the people. Now, I'm not trying to teach you that God wasn't present, that he somehow was ignoring his people. He had obviously worked on their behalf. He had been wooing them back into right relationship with him. But there's a certain cloud of heaviness as the Old Testament closes. And if you study some, some history, and I am not a great history student, but in the whole time, in between, when it's quiet, when it's dark in our pages, when it's silent, we find out that even those who had returned to Jerusalem, even those who had come back to the land, were bullied, <laughs> were oppressed. One empire, one nation after another charged them money to exist, basically extorted them. Um, came in and occupied for a time and told them what to do until finally we get to the New Testament opening up and we find a fresh context, right? In the beginning of the New Testament, we find out who's in charge now. Well, it's the Romans. The Roman Empire has come into power and has soldiers living in the land and their own governors. And even the Jewish leaders who are allowed to have some part are subject to the Roman leaders and really don't have their own power. Power. They're being allowed to worship in their own way so long as it doesn't really spill out of the temple and cause too much issue anywhere else. They had tried at times to get independence. They had tried at times in small groups or larger uprises to resist the Romans, to throw them off, to stand up against. In fact, by the time we get to Jesus, there's a whole group known as the Zealots who had at different times uh, uh, sparked different rebellious activity. The Zealots, in their use of the term, as best I understand it, is pretty close to how we use the term terrorist today. They were seen as those who were, um, who were problem causers and were set on their ideology so much that they were willing to do pretty much anything to get their point across, to speak out against the Romans. There was this tension back and forth with government and with politics and with 
um, trying to keep the peace of people, and whoever could keep the peace of people with people then got a slice of the economic pie, a slice of the prestige, a, a slice of the authority and power in the area. Jerusalem, Judea, Israel was seen as this little hillbilly outpost on the corner edge of the Roman Empire. It was not highly thought of. It was seen as often a problem territory. Sometimes, even within the Roman system, it was seen as the place that you sent the the noble person, the official, the somebody who was in the court of Rome who really wasn't very liked by the emperor or by the other leaders. It was kind of the punishment place. It was kind of the Siberia posting or northern Alaska posting. You know what I'm talking about, any of you military vets? Okay, like way out there. Okay, where am I trying to go with this? When Jesus talks about blessing to the people, he's making a contrast to how they feel, how they understand themselves at the time. They saw themselves as oppressed. They saw themselves as distant from God in many ways. They saw themselves as not experienced Experiencing the full glory that they had been promised, what they learn about in synagogue class. It didn't seem to be manifest around them. They weren't living the abundant life that they were expecting to. It didn't seem very much like God was on their side and blessing them and taking care of them and walking with them. Now Jesus comes onto the scene and he starts saying and teaching things that were quite disruptive. <laughs> he starts doing things that are obvious good things and so it draws a crowd. He's helping people. He healed people. He talked to people. He challenged people. We've already talked about some of the miracles that he did and sometimes he just kind of did the miracle and someone was physically changed or blessed. And sometimes he spoke to them very challenging and would say things like, your sins are forgiven you. And he would hit a whole different layer. It wasn't just this superficial do something for attention. And he comes and he starts gathering his disciples. And then these crowds would gather around him and listen to him and he would teach them and he would challenge them with parables and he would speak to them and he would demonstrate in his very manner over and over again we've read in the New Testament how there was just something about him. He was different. He said things differently. He spoke with a different authority. He walked with a different purity. When the Pharisees tried to trip him up and trap him with their seasoned theological questions and debates, he just had a way of slipping past it and putting the target right back on their own hearts over and over again. So when he comes... And different scholars describe this differently and debate about these first few um, verses here of exactly what's happening. Whether he's doing a retreat with his disciples, whatever the case is, we're told that he sees the crowd. He got used to crowds by now. There's another crowd. And he goes up on a hillside and sits down. That wasn't uncommon for rabbis to do, to sit to speak. And he sits down and we're told, at least at the beginning here, that the disciples come around him, and he's talking to them. It could be that the whole crowd comes right away. Certainly by the time we get to the end of chapter 7, we know that the crowd has gathered around, and even some Pharisees and different folks. But at this point, we're not certain, but at least his disciples have gathered around. 
And they've experienced a few things with him by this point. They've seen some stuff. And he begins to talk to them. And in our study notes, it talks about how he begins to lay down the norms of the kingdom. What do we mean by norms? What to expect. The normal pattern of things. Guys, if you're going to walk with me, (laughs) if I'm going to be your rabbi, if I'm going to be your teacher, more than that, If you're really going to believe who I am and really go on this journey with me to draw near to the Father, this is what it's going to look like. Okay, let's head into the blessings. I am not going to do what we typically do from the pulpit. I'm not going to do a detailed breakdown of each one of these phrases today, I think. I'm going to try to resist. Let's tackle the first uh, few and the last few together because there is a uniting theme. Verses 3 through 5 and then again verses 10 and 11 here pick up. It talks about the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. And even, I add it in, blessed are the gentle, or some of your translations will use the word meek, right? For they shall inherit the earth. By the time he gets down to verse 10, then he kicks into a new chunk. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And in verse 11, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil things about you. There's a theme here, isn't there? There's a theme of suffering, of discomfort, of not having pleasant things be the mark of our lives. That's an interesting place to start if you're Jesus. Okay, I want to tell you about my kingdom. I want to tell you what lies ahead, the invitation that you have received. What are you joining? What are you becoming a part of? Let me start by saying, in contrast to what you see of yourself or what you've experienced, you are blessed of God. Let me tell you a few of those times when you can recognize God's blessing. You know those times that are miserable? When you hurt and are in pain? When you're grieving? When you're mistreated? When you're bullied? When the world doesn't understand you? I'm stealing from other places in the... New Testament, when they hate you because of me, yeah, that's all blessing. (laughs) That's all God's favor. That is a reminder and a sealing to our heart that you are in relationship with God and he's got you on an adventure, a journey of being closer to him than you are with the world that is earmarked, that is saturated with, that is controlled by the very nature of sin itself. As you separate from that, as God's working in your life, as you experience his favor made manifest, you're not going to fit. And there's times when you're not going to be happy and comfortable. You're going to experience grief. You're going to experience suffering. You're going to experience mourning. You're going to experience mistreatment. Over and over at the end of these, he gives a word of encouragement. And again, I just don't have the time to break all of these down today. But it's a fun study to go through and match up how each one of these encouragements, each one of these long-term blessings, these results, what will come of this? What does God have in store for you? How that matches up and couples with the difficulty or the challenge. 
Theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. They will be comforted. I'm going to pause on this one. I can't resist the temptation because I've been wrestling with this one. One, because I'm not used to the word meek. I mean, I grew up hearing the word meek, but it's not an idea that I just use on a daily basis. Anybody, like, just real comfortable with the word meek? We don't use that much. We don't really talk that way. If it were to come out, it's seen as very, very negative, isn't it? I appreciate that some of our translations shift that a little bit with the word gentle. It kind of builds the idea here. I think you can, your job is to test these things that I'm saying with Scripture. So you've got to wrestle with this yourself. But I think, as I've been ch challenged with this and have been wrestling with it, I think it includes, at the very least... The idea of that as we're drawing near to God, whether it be part of his coupling with how he's already um, made some of us individually in our unique personalities, or whether it's totally counter to our normal personalities and is a new thing that God, God's doing, but as we draw near to him, there is a humility of spirit that I think affects even how we interact in the world. That some of those high priorities, those go, 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 those win things for yourself, the make the circumstances go your way for us control freaks, uh, the, the climb to the top of the corporate ladder, all these kinds of things. And I am not trying to say that every element of that is inherently evil. But I think the priorities begin to shift in putting God first and we're not so upfront about the stuff of this world that the world puts such high priority on. And I think part of what Jesus is saying here is when it doesn't seem like you're getting ahead the way everybody thinks you're supposed to scramble and get ahead, when you're not pressing for yourself, when you're not putting yourself first, when you're not holding others back, when you're not fighting against so much because this stuff isn't as important, look at what he says. What's, what's the, the coupling here? They shall inherit the earth. Does that sound familiar to what Jesus said in another place where he says, seek first, by the way, it's coming later in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God, what? And all this stuff that we were just talking about, it'll be added to you. I don't know that that's a promise of, I'll give you lots of stuff. I think what he's saying there is the priority shift and he's promising to take care of what we need. And here I think he's saying, you know, if your spirit changes because of what I'm doing in your heart and your priorities shift, it's okay. God's going to take care of you. I was talking to a friend just not too long ago who had an opportunity at work to take a new position that meant moving from a tech position into a managerial position. There's nothing wrong with that. He works hard for a living, great guy, great reputation. He deserves the advancement, means more money, means more prestige, more opportunity with his, within the business to climb up. He's also looking and saying, I've only got a few years left with my kiddos in the house. And he turned it down. Now, it, it's not a moral imperative. I don't know that God would have smited him if he chose to take the job. Uh, but as we wrestle with working out our salvation with fear and trembling, I love that passage. As we wrestle with how do we apply the stuff of God, we see that it's okay for our priorities to shift and come into alignment with God and that he will work things out. Okay, I better get off my soapbox, huh? <clears throat> So 
So there's some negative sounding ones here, right? All of these situations that loosely fit in the category of suffering. But there's a bunch of positive ones too. The whole middle section. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So that's not just feel hungry in their bellies because they're not getting enough food, right? But are going after God. Because they will be sanctified, right? They will, God will honor that and set them apart for his special use and purpose. He's going to meet them with a cleansing of their spirit and, and, and working in them. i got to keep moving. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. All these beautiful things. In our study notes, it talks about that all of this speaks to the edification of God's body, the church, of believers. That these, these attitudes are part of the edification process. What do we mean by edification? The process of growth and maturity of the church, both individually and collectively. Edification, you've heard that before, maybe. It comes from the idea of building, constructing, building something up. So to edify in a social sense with one another is to do the things that encourage, that promote, that build one another up. So the idea is that we are stronger, we are more collectively than the sum of our individual parts. Sound familiar? That within the kingdom, we are to reflect God's character through the use of, to borrow from other places in Scripture, the use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the things that God is doing, working in our life, and changing our own character, we are to use that for the good of everyone, to strengthen the body, whether that be in some skill or task, or whether it be in this very way, shining with the character of of God showing these attitudes is part of the overall building process. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. That's okay. I grew up in church. Not everyone here did. That's okay. You don't have to to get this. I grew up in church. I was around churchy people a lot. There are lovely churchy people I have met all over the place. They are my favorite people in the world. They are some of my very best friends and have made the most impact on me and encouragers to me. I know that there are many who have prayed for me consistently, ongoingly. They've made a huge impact on my life. There are also churchy people who are curmudgeonly. You ever met them? They also have an impact. They also leave a mark, make an impression, don't they? You see, it isn't just our head knowledge of how quick we can flip to a verse in a Bible drill or how skillfully we can argue a theological point that matters within the life of the church. Sometimes the smile on our face the pleasantness of our spirit, the willingness to help, the vulnerability of confession makes way more impact on the overall health and growth of the body and drawing near to God than the stuff we try to put forward as our Christian faith or faith. Can't get the word out. Okay. God is working in the body to edify the whole, the church, his people. 
I better move a little faster because we're getting somewhere today. We only have one verse in the next section, so we're in luck. Jesus' disciples are to be salt of the earth. We just read this a moment ago. Many of you are quite familiar with this. I don't know that I have anything to add detail-wise in the description of salt and its nature and how it works and all these things that we usually hear about with these passages. So I'm going to move along a little bit. I love this statement. The salt of the disciples. So if he's saying... You are the salt of the earth. Disciples, you all, those who believe, those who are following after Jesus, you're the salt of the earth. What does that mean? The salt of the disciples is spread over this world. Isn't that a great picture? Did you know that we're not it this morning? This is not the whole kingdom of God? Thank you, Lord. Not because not anything negative about any of us, but I hope it's a lot bigger than us. And it is. God's word has gone forth through faithful men and women, boys and girls, and has been spread, is being spread all over the earth. And that is a huge part of God's mission, is that the truth of who Jesus is and his grace for all people to bring them into a saving faith and salvation is for everybody. And so the salt of these disciples, even though on this day he was talking to a small group in the early stages, but he's saying it's going to go everywhere. It's going to spread, and as it spreads, here's just two thoughts. The role within the world is going to be one of preservation. Huge part of how salt was used in its day is to make things last. Food, right? To preserve this earth. What do we mean by that? To share the gospel that there might be salvation, to preserve the very souls of the people who, because of the role of sin in this world and its pervasiveness, are damned to hell. It is to spread and to preserve. It also has the role of making, this is kind of a weird way of saying it, um, to create a hunger or I use the fancy word, a palate, a taste for, and a thirst for God himself. Well, I'm still working on this. I'm still wrestling with this. You can maybe help me this morning. I'm interested in your thoughts later on. Something about how God chooses to have his body, us, his people in the world, As we're wrestling and struggling and coming to peace with God and understanding him and allowing him full access to our lives and working in our hearts and kicking out the old garbage and bringing up areas that need some tweaking and encouraging us and giving us strength and working in our lives when we express some faith until that muscle grows stronger. Something about what God is doing in all of us individually becomes a group whole testimony and is supposed to be creating a taste, a hunger, a desire for God. There's an interesting seeming paradox in Scripture, particularly in the Old Testament. Because on one hand, we're told... You're to be salt. People are supposed to see you, we'll get there in a moment, and desire what you have. Your father, not just be covetous for your things. Nobody cares about that stuff, right? But to see a difference in you that they desire. At the same time, Jesus warns us, as you're walking around and making a difference and looking more and more like me, the world's not going to be very tolerant of it. 
They're not going to like that. They're not going to want to see a mirror of their old selves in your transformed life and be convicted. They're going to hate you. Kingdoms will rise. People will rise to fight against, to tear down, to throw away, to stifle the word of God and you along with it. The prince of this world will seek to destroy and devour, to separate, to attack. So at the same time, we're to be creating a hunger and a desire for God. It is not going to be just a uh, skip through the roses. Easy and comfortable. Okay, I better keep going here. Here's one last statement. It's, I don't like this one. To cease to be salt. This is... This is just me paraphrasing what we already just read. This is not fancy here. To cease to be salt is to become ineffective disciples. Do you see that? If the salt loses its taste, what's it for anymore? I've never tasted unsalty salt. I think that's called a rock. I don't know. I've heard fancy people talk about refining processes and in their day, you know, salt was mixed with other stuff. Whatever. Let's get down to the easy part. It isn't useful anymore. If it doesn't fulfill its purpose, it's not necessary. It's not important. That doesn't feel good. If we, as disciples, if we cease to be salt we become ineffective in our role of displaying the values of the kingdom. It becomes a worthless testimony. And I don't like this part. And it results in judgment, right? That's not a very nice, comfortable way of saying it. What is it saying? This is at the crux of what it is that God desires from us. Not behavior and works and do good stuff first. No, 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 no. It's draw near to me, draw near to the Father, and as you do, he will bless you and transform and meddle in your life and make you more and more like him. If that's not happening, it's not very nice to say, but I'm going to say it. You're not a disciple. If the evidence of God is not present in your life, that should be a huge red flag. You should be expecting to be uncomfortable with some things, to have some mistreatments. You should be expecting your attitudes to mold and transform and to be more like him. This is a weird way of saying it. It should be easier for you to love people today than it was when you first said yes to Jesus. That's challenging sometimes in our city, in our community, in our time. There's supposed to be work going on that is the evidence of God's presence. It is God's presence first. It's drawing near to him, and out of that, we live righteous lives that are salty to the world, that shine for him. And I better get through shining because your tummies are rumbling. Jesus' disciples, sorry, come on, there it is. Jesus' disciples are the light of this world. God intends for his disciples to shine, to be seen 
and to make a difference in the darkness of their surroundings. Do your surroundings seem dark to you? I don't know if we still have news watchers today or how you get your news. I think some of us are pretty well bunkered down and hiding from all things news at this point, especially if it's political season. Uh, As we drive up and down the highways and we see the effects on brothers and sisters in their lives, as we swap stories with the people at work, because it seems like they always go to those negative stories of how hard the world is and how things are going. What's supposed to be making a difference? Oh, there's probably, I'm not trying to get political this morning. I'm sure there is a time and a place for programs and initiatives and the use of finances, and all of those kinds of things. I am not speaking, I don't have energy to speak for or against those things this morning. I can tell you from the words of Scripture that what is supposed to make a difference in our world is you and I looking a whole lot, acting a whole lot, smelling a whole lot, tasting a whole lot like Jesus. Sometimes that means we're going to work together and put things together. Sometimes it means we're going to join in politics and use that power muscle. Sometimes it just means I'm going to say hi to somebody instead of ignoring them. Sometimes it means I'm going to give of my finances. Sometimes it means I'm going to give away some stuff. Sometimes it means I'm going to share a meal. Sometimes it means I'm just going to take some time. You name it, it can be all kinds of different things. I'm just saying, when we look at the news and we feel frustrated, and there is plenty justifiable to be frustrated with, the answer to that has always been and will continue to be Jesus in you and me. Only he can do the work And he has chosen to do at least the vast majority of that work through his people, you and I. Okay, I'll keep going. If we're supposed to be shining, if we're supposed to be light in the world and reflecting Jesus, then that means we are not to be shining for the sake of our own pride, to draw attention to ourselves, to get on the front pages or the news or how, you know, whatever media source we use these days, to build ourselves up. There are plenty of people who do good things in this world. Some of them are wrong motive. And some of them even though they're well-meaning, fall flat of the transformational work that God really intends because it's void of his spirit. There is only a few, a remnant, a little salt shaker worth of those who have humbled themselves and have submitted themselves to the Lord, that they can go out without seeking credit and allow the Holy Spirit to have access and to seek the betterment of another's soul along with their circumstances. That's supposed to be you and me. We're those uniquely called out ones that God is using right now. Nobody else can do it in our stead. We should be raising up the next generation to watch and follow along and get the hang of it with us. And by the hang of it, I don't mean our programs and our style. I mean our closeness to the Father. 
Only we can do the job right now. Okay, let me finish up with these little bits. I have found this over and over to be um, a, pa- a verse in Scripture that I know challenges my heart, and so I'll let it sit with you. Verse 16, where we end the day. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I put it in the notes this way. Whether we like it or not, our lives elicit a reaction to God. If you're called by his name, if you participate in a church, if you read your Bible and seek to put it into practice, if you live in relationship with the Lord, then your life is going to make an impression about God. What impression will that be? That's a rhetorical question. Do you know why? Because you don't know the answer. You don't get to decide. All you can decide is the building blocks, the discipline, the humility that you are willing to have to draw near to God and follow after him. And believe that in his blessing of your life, in his faithfulness to work in you, that the end result of that will be glory to God. I've tried. You can try to make it a task. You can try to make it a goal. God, I'm going to glorify you. I'm going to do it right this time. I wrestle with that sometimes just preparing sermons for people I know of somehow I'm going to do it right and they're going to fall at the altar and worship you. Every, as a youth pastor, I struggled with that. Oh God, help me to say just the right things that today's the day. There's not, I don't know that that's a wrong heart, but it ain't how it works. I don't get to force it into happening. I've got to trust the Father to work in me and through me as I make myself available, as I say yes to him, as I let him bring up the hard stuff and work on it in my life. Then he can use us as salt and light and impact this world. Because we have been blessed by God with salvation through Jesus, we live as salt and life in the world so that others might come to trust in Jesus. And if I may add, and be totally saved. Would you pray with me? Lord God, these are familiar words to your people. Important, beloved words to us. Now maybe they be even more than that. May your presence, may your beautiful control in our life be our hunger and thirst, our heartbeat. Thank you that you have said we are blessed regardless of the external circumstances we might be tempted to look to and point to. That you have blessed us with knowing you and drawing near to you and your very presence. And as we walk in that blessing, as we we are gifted with, as we see your character, blossom and come to fruit in our lives. Lord, may it be for your glory. 
May you continue to transform this world one soul, one individual at a time. Lord, thank you that you've invited us to be a part of that. Thank you for changing our hearts. And God, we hunger that you would change many, many more. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name, amen. I invite you out to a camp meeting this evening at 7 o'clock. And you are dismissed to go be salt and light with the attitudes of Christ himself. You're dismissed.